understanding European mentality, knowing that once you are a celebrity or a star, you are one for life. They give you your, your props and your due for life. In America, you're only as good as your last basket, your last touchdown, and your last movie. They forget about you real quick because they started looking past you for that next star that's coming up to remind them of what you used to do. Rather than hang on to your persona, they're looking for that next person to replace you. Europe is not like that. Europe, they give you your prop, they give you your due. You can, you can work forever and ever because once they like you, they like you forever. So I wanted to get into this mindset. I wanted to be someplace where I could do the kind of films I want and get the proper respect that I wanted. So it worked out for me that I was able to make films in Italy and in and, and Europe that were also sold in the market in the U.S. So it worked out pretty good for me, which gave me my longevity, which is why people don't ever say, and I'll never give them a chance to say, whatever happened to the hammer? Because the hammer is always going to be around doing something because I have a market. You're the king of the Bronx, but if you don't want hammer to screw you, you got to give me a hand. Oh, yeah? The moment I move, it's war. The film industry in, in Europe has died relative to films being made that are sold in America. But that's their fault because they never trusted American people. The American producers, which they have a right not to because some of them are a little strange. But to make a low-budget film, you have to have good inside contacts if you're going to leave your nest and go to somebody else's nest with a small amount of money. You have to basically trust that person and trust what they say so that you don't go over budget and start asking for needing more money to finish your project. So they never really trusted that they could come over to America and make a, a film under a million dollars without being ripped off, without having the money being stolen, or without having prices go up and jacked up on them. So they made a lot of really bad um, imitations of American films. They would go to places like Santo Domingo for New York. We shot Black Cobra II in Manila for New York. Uh, ironically, there are some two or three blocks of, 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 of buildings and in, in, in commercial area in Manila that looks like New York. But once you get outside of that, you got palm trees and little short people, man, and so you can't be in New York. In Rome, you can shoot, you can shoot uh, New York because they have Euro City, which is a, a, the modern part of, of Rome, is, is quite nice. And, and as long as you stay in, inside and stay around that area, you can really get away with it, which is what we did in Black Cobra 1. Black Cobra 1, we shot in the new part of Rome for New York, and it worked, and it worked. But they made a lot of films like that, pretending to be one place and shoot someplace else. And so it, part of their downfall was trying to mimic high-budget American films rather than uh, take advantage of their own, their own intelligence and their, and their own concepts and what they had, that was part of their downfall. The best movies that came out of <coughs> Europe are the war movies because they had all the great locations, they had all the great equipment, so they didn't have to copy anybody there. I mean, a war movie is a war movie. When you do a film like, like this, you're, you're, you know, that, that was the time period when they were making the, the warlord. Warlord kind of kind of films, you know. I did this one. I did one called New Gladiators, Barbarians. right? New Barbarians. That's when you know all the guys in the in the strange driving machines and, and the strange hair and Wars of the Wasteland. I mean, that was hot then, and so they were copying. They were copying uh, Mad Max because Mad Max was made in Europe, so it was made in Australia. So it didn't have it didn't have the docks of New York, or the or the L's of of Chicago that they that they don't have there. So it was easy for them to match that film, and that film was successful. So it was easy for them to jump on that bandwagon and, 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 and mimic those, those characters and those concepts with the films that I did. That was easy to do. You know, when you, take a, when you scale down a big budget film and try to duplicate it with a small budget, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It, it comes out hokey. I ain't talking auctions. My plan is to visit the ogre. Talk to the ogre? Are you out of your fucking mind, man? Shut your mouth and listen, asshole. I think those Manhattan big shots are trying to trap us because of Ann. We could never take them on alone. We need allies. And that means every writer in the Bronx. And three tough guys with Isaac Hayes might have been, uh, we started in New York and finished in Rome. That was Dino De Laurentiis. 
Yeah, we shot without sync sound over there in America. We did, you know. And then I did, um, um, I did a gangster movie with Peter Boyle. I did um, Crazy Joe Gallo. Crazy Joe Gallo was part, part in, in New York and part in in Rome. So, anything anything the Italians came over here, we shot direct sound. Anytime you went to Italy, they it's just wow, we don't have to do that anymore. So it was like a burden on them to shoot direct sound because everybody had to be quiet. Nobody could talk. You couldn't order your, your coffee. You couldn't get your tea. American people are very particular. You know, the, the, the mouth and the words must always match. They weren't always that particular about that because they're, they, they didn't shoot direct sound. They never shot direct sound. They shot on, uh, on cameras that sound like washing machines. And while you're doing your dialogue, there's somebody t bringing order a, a Coke or bring a sandwich. Or you hear all this in the background because they know it's not being recorded, so they don't care. They're not that particular. The hardest thing is to have the noisy camera and people talking. People talking, and they're talking about nothing. You know, is my, my coffee is, is my coffee ready? Uh, bring me a sandwich. All this stuff you hear as an actor. And they're not whispering, man. I mean, they're just talking because they know that the sound is no good anyway. It's not going to be used. That is probably the hardest thing to get used to is this noisy camera because they use Airflex, no sound Airflex. They use, they use that, and everybody is talking. That's the hardest part of working in Europe. The French do different. Though. The French shoot like Americans. The French shoot direct sound, and they shoot just like Americans. The Italians, uh, Hong Spain, Hong Kong, Hong Kong they shoot. No sound. Every film that I did there did get an American dist distributor to do it, you know. And at the same time that I was there, I was also making contacts so I could make my own film and raise money to make my own films. I did Mr. Mean on the weekends when I was shooting uh, Inglorious Bastards, and I would use their equipment for free. And I would take their crew on the weekends and go shoot Mr. Mean. So, it all, you know, it, was, uh, it all worked out. They gave me the equipment for free. And I shot it on the weekend, so it all worked out.